So you've built a bike generator and you want to know how much physical power you're pushing out through your legs versus the electrical power generated. Now you can either spend 500 quid on a power meter or you can use your kitchen scales and a bit of maths. Now obviously kitchen scales are not optimal for this procedure, but I just want to demonstrate that it is possible to do good science and give yourself a reasonable working bit of knowledge without fancy equipment just by using stuff you've got at home. Now if you've got a luggage scale, one that you kind of dangle your suitcases from, that would be better than kitchen scales. But I wanted to go back to basics because almost everyone's got a set of kitchen scales, right? So that's why we're using kitchen scales. Won't give us the most accurate reading, but it'll be accurate enough. So if you've got a power meter, an electrical power meter, or a volt and an amp meter on the bike, on the output, as we have on this system, you can easily tell how much electrical power you're producing. And meters like that are very cheap. You can get a voltmeter and an amp meter for 10 quid, probably, something like that. But that's a bit different from the physical power that you're putting out through your legs. The reason for that is you've got to turn the mechanism, right? So you've got to make this go around. You've got to turn the alternator shaft, you've got to turn the wheel, and there's friction in the system. Also, the alternator as a generating device is not 100% efficient. In fact, alternators generally aren't particularly efficient. DC generators are a lot more efficient. So we've got to take that into account as well. So the reason for the kitchen scales is to figure out how much force we need to put on the pedals, how much torque we need to generate, in order to turn the mechanism and we're going to start from there. Right we've got our measuring device a set of kitchen scales now as I mentioned they're not mega accurate these for what we're doing but it doesn't matter it'll give us a working figure as you'll see. Uh, so first of all set it to zero make sure it's set to zero and get the crank of the bike sort of roughly pointed down slightly back so that you can push against it with the scales all right. What we're going to do we're going to push with the scales um, and we're just going to keep it turning with the scales pushing it around so that all the force required to move this pedal is going through the kitchen scales and you need to get it directly on the middle so that you get a proper reading don't, don't put it over to one side so let's see what we get got caught on there but you see it got to about 5.4 kilos didn't it now let's try it again five point six that time let's do it one more time five point six again um, I'm gonna move it slightly so I can stop it bumping on the on the uh, chain stay Now you see it, it elevated a bit there, but that's because I went I went off track and I ended up pushing against the crank, so that's not a true reading. So um, we got 5.6 there three times, didn't we, for a while? So that's what we're gonna. That's the figure we're gonna use. Now, what the scales have given us there is a mass. Okay, it's not actually technically a weight. So uh, common language and scientific language differs in this way. Uh, a, weight, a weight is a force which is measured in newtons, not kilograms. So the kilograms there is a mass, which doesn't make sense for what we need. We need to know how much force it takes to turn this pedal, to turn these cranks. So we need to convert that mass, 5.6 kilos, into a force. And to do that, we need Newton's second law. So let's go inside and do a bit of maths. Now, before we get to Newton's second law, some of you may have noticed that there's probably a bit of a problem with that measurement that we took, other than the fact that we're using a big chunky set of kitchen scales to take the measurement. 
And the problem is that we were starting the cranks from scratch and we were only pushing them through a quarter turn. So probably what we were doing is causing the cranks to undergo an angular acceleration as we were pushing the pedal. We probably weren't pushing with the, the pedals and the wheel rotating at a constant speed. And that really is the force that we want because once we've pedaled up to speed, it's the constant force really that, that we're interested in to maintain that speed. So we will need to account for that. Um, and I say probably because um, it's difficult to tell without also measuring the speed at the same time. Um, but we will, we will need to take account of that. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead with the measurement that we took and see what it comes out at and then we can change the model a little bit. So, so this whole process really is making a mathematical model and we have to make modeling simplifications. We have to sort of decide that we're not gonna take certain things into account in order to make it workable. Because there are all sorts of things that come into play and they get more and more and more detailed. But we're looking for a basic rough working figure. Okay, so Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. So we want a force. We've got a mass, 5.6 kilos, and we need an acceleration to multiply that mass by in order to get a force. Now, kitchen scales are designed to resist gravity when a mass is placed on them. So because they are designed and set up and calibrated to work against gravity, we can exploit that in order to get our acceleration. So the acceleration due to gravity at the Earth's surface is known to a reasonable degree of accuracy. And it's called little g. So we have force here equals mg. And little g is approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. So we can plug those numbers in to get our force. So we've got 5.6 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 and I'm just rounding it to 9.8 because we've only got this to two significant figures. Um, and this is, you know, it's not particularly accurate anyway. So we only need to work to two significant figures here. 9.8 meters per second squared. So we multiply those together and we get 54.88 kilogram meters per second squared. Uh, where this is, an arbitrary level of accuracy so let's round that a little bit I'll keep it to three significant figures for now and we'll reduce it back to two as we go through the calculation newtons because one newton is kilogram meters per second squared so that gives us our force now that is the force with no electrical load connected to it all that force is doing is just operating the, the mechanical parts of the generator with no resistance no electrical resistance and this is going to form the first part of our power. So we've got a force. Now we need to think about power. So power is the work done in a time interval. Excuse my writing. It is rubbish. Always has been. Um, so this is a, the force applied over a distance per unit time. Okay, so force applied over a distance per unit time. And the units of power are watts. And a watt is joules per second. Or kilogram meters squared per second cubed. So we need to think about this force being applied over a distance per unit time. So we have to think about what distance and what unit time. Now I always look at SI units. These are the SI units, so Standard International, it's French I think, International Standard Units. I'm not going to try the try in French. Um, kilogram meter squared per second cubed. And what we've got here is kilogram meters per second squared. So this says we need to multiply by something which is meters per second or meters seconds to the minus one because that will give us the correct uh, unit for our power. And it's always useful to do that because it just gives you a clue as to whether you're doing the calculation right or not. So that's why it's always good to include units in your calculations. 
So what's the distance? Well, we know that when a crank turns, it turns in a, in a circle, a more or less perfect circle, because it's attached to um, an axis at the middle. Now, at this point, you may be thinking this is a rotational dynamics problem. It makes sense to use torque rather than forces. Um, and you certainly can use torque. But torque is a little bit more complicated. It involves vector products and that kind of thing and rates of change, you know, derivatives. So I will do it with torque at the end of the video. But there's a bit of a shortcut we can apply here just by thinking about the situation. And that's what I want to do. So let's think about a cyclist pedalling a bike. So the average cyclist may pedal at about a cadence of 80. Now that, what that means is they're going to turn the cranks about 80 times every minute. So 80 RPM, revs per minute. Now we want our unit time to be a second because that just makes it easy for the calculation. So what is this per second? It's simply 80 divided by 60 equals 4 over 3 revolutions per second, okay? Or 4 over 3 per second. So we seem to have, this is, this is something to do with our, with our unit time. How far is it going? Well, we know that the circumference of the circle is given by 2 pi r, okay? 2 pi we know, and r in this case is the distance from the uh, axle in the bottom bracket to the crank pedal. And we know what that is as well, because this is a, this is a crank which is 175 millimetres. Now again, we don't want millimetres really, we want metres, because uh, that makes it easy to calculate. So that is 0 0.175 metres. So, clearly what we need to multiply um, to get our power, power equals force times distance times per unit time, or time to the minus one. So we know our force, so we've got here 54.9 newtons. We're going to multiply by our distance, which is 2 pi, multiply by 0.175 meters, so times 2 pi times 0.175 meters times 4 over 3 per second, because it does this distance, this, this circumference, as you're pedaling at 80 RPM, you are doing 4 over 3 circumferences every second. So more than one, so that's 1.33 recurring. I've left a fraction there because it's easier to work with than a recurring decimal. So this is the number of times that you're um, doing this circumference, you're turning uh, the pedals on, on this circumference. So what does this give us? Turns out that that is, I've done this in two in my notes, 54.9 newtons times seven over 15 pi meters per second and it turns out that that is 80.49 newton meters per second or watts. Uh, we're going to round that down to two significant figures because uh, we don't there's no point with this 0.49 because we, we aren't working to that level of accuracy so let's call this 80 watts. So we've got here an estimate for the power it's going to take to turn the generator with no load attached. But we said at the beginning this is maybe a bit of a problem um, and we should consider this very much an upper estimate when we think about what we've done and how we've taken the measurement. And when we think about that we've probably overestimated a little bit because we've probably been accelerating the cranks as we've been, as we've been pushing. And the reason that the reading will have stayed constant is we've, we've probably just kept the acceleration linear. I say probably, it's likely, we don't know for definite because we haven't measured the speed of the wheel. So in order to keep this simple, and again, this is a, a simple mathematical model just to give us a working figure. Let's assume that we've, we've overestimated a little bit. What might be an amount that we'd overestimate by? Maybe about 10% because we're pushing to get that crank going and we haven't turned it very far. 
So let's see what it comes out at if we think um, that we've that we've measured it over measured it by, by 10%. Let, let, let's do that. So that would make it about five kilos. Let's make it a nice round number. So let's let's create an equation for power from scratch. Now we did it in two in two bits there at the top. We're just going to do it in one now because um, we know what we're doing, so it makes it a little bit easier. So if power is force times distance times per unit time or times time to the minus one, that gives us ma, um, or in this case mg. We know that it's mg that we're doing. Multiply by our distance, multiply by our units of time to the minus one. So our mass is five kilos. Our acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Our distance is two pi times 0.175 meters. And we do that four over three times per second. And if we put all that together, we get 71.84 watts or 72 watts. Now, we don't know specifically which one of them is, is, is accurate and uh, we're not going to. Without taking more accurate measurements, we're probably not going to. Now, as a cyclist and someone who's ridden with power meters and that kind of thing, 80 watts feels a lot, 72 watts still seems like quite a lot simply to turn the generator, but this feels more realistic to me than this. So we're gonna go with 72 watts. Uh, we know that it's likely we'll have, we will have uh, caused an acceleration. So this is what we're gonna go with. This is our working figure. So our power here is, we're gonna call that P mech. Okay, so our P mech equals 72 watts. Now, that is going to stay more or less constant as we're pedaling, and that's 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 in our in our in our mathematical model, and that's going to be required no matter what the electrical load on the circuit is. We've got to keep that mechanical system moving with all its friction, moving parts, etc. We've got to keep that going uh, all the time, whether or not we've got electrical load on there. So that's constant. So our power our total power, our leg power, if you will, that we're going to put out, let's call that P leg, is going to equal, P mech as a constant, right? It's going to stay constant. And then we need the electrical power. So we're going to be uh, generating electrical power, and what that's going to do is cause resistance in the alternator, which means we're going to have to put more, more power out through our legs. So what is electrical power? Well, it turns out this is pretty straightforward uh, and we've already got a means of measuring this on the bike generator. So electrical power, or P elec, is just current times voltage. And current is measured in amps and voltage is measured in, fairly straightforwardly, volts. Now, on our bike generator, we have a volt and amp meter, or a volt ammeter. And this will give us a readout. So all we have to do is multiply these two things together, and that gives us the electrical power that we're generating. But there's one further complication, and it's something which we, um, we need to take account of. It's not something we can say, well, that's a simplification we're making, because it's actually quite significant. And that is that alternators aren't especially efficient as generating devices. And in fact, our alternator uh, on the generator has an efficiency rating of 69%. Um, which isn't great, actually, is it really? But they don't need to be especially good in cars because there isn't an awful lot to power and you don't want to fry a battery. So 69% uh, equals 69 over 100. That's what it means, 69% or per 100. So we need to bring this into our calculation. So what this means is that when we're putting power into the alternator, 
only 69% of it is being converted into useful electrical power at the other end. So we need to use the reciprocal of that uh, to calculate the amount of power it needs to get the power that we're reading off our volt and ammeter. So our actual P elect, or let's say this is the power into the alternator, so our power into alternator, equals reciprocal, so 1 over 0.69 times P elect, or P elect over 0.69. And that will give us the amount of power we need to put into the alternator, the mechanical power we need to put into the alternator, in order to get a given amount of electrical power out. So as an example, let's say we are getting a, we're generating 100 watts of power, power into alternator. Now this will be for 100 watts, let's call this power in alt, our suffixes, our subscripts are getting a bit dodgy here, aren't they? But you know what I mean. Power into alternator equals 100 watts over 0.69. That gives us approximately 145 watts. So in order to get 100 watts of electrical power out, we've got to put 145 watts of power into the alternator. So we've got a, we've got a starting point here now for thinking about our total leg power. So let's rehash our P leg equals P mech plus P elect over 0.69. This is a constant and this varies based on this variable here. So we know what this constant is. We said that that is 72 watts. So it equals 72 watts plus P elect over 0.69 and we're leaving that variable in because it depends on how many how much current how much power we're generating at the time and we can we can take that reading and put experimental figures into there to, to, to look at what it would be given certain amounts. So that's the power that we're going to need to generate. Now at this point astute uh, viewers and anyone who's a, a physicist or engineer will certainly have spotted another problem with this calculation. Now if you haven't spotted this problem and you want a bit of a challenge, because this is also going to be wrong, it's going to give us a figure that's a little bit too high. If you haven't spotted that problem, pause the video and just see if you can spot what that problem is. Did you spot the problem? Now, there are actually two problems. There's a subtle one, but also quite a major one. The subtle one really is that this is not really constant. Um, there are various things that come into play here with uh, friction, the coefficients of friction, uh, drag, aerodynamic drag, and, and various bits and pieces. As you speed up and you're pedaling at different rates and at different temperatures and that kind of thing, this is going to vary a little bit. But really, the degree of variation versus the accuracy of measurement that we've undertaken is, is probably insignificant for our modelling purposes here. So I'm going to ignore that. I just wanted to acknowledge it. I'm going to ignore it and we're going to work with this figure. It, it, it feels okay to do that. The Any changes due to drag and friction, that kind of thing, will be fairly small. But there's another more serious problem. We measured the mechanical uh, resistance. We, we, we measured the force that it takes to overcome the mechanical resistance of the system with its friction and drag. But we've also used an efficiency rating for the alternator, which includes its mechanical inefficiency. So what we've done is we've, we've accounted for that mechanical inefficiency twice effectively, because it's included in there and it's included in there. So what we need to do is make sure that we only account for that once. The problem is that we've measured the mechanical uh, resistance of the entire system, in, which includes the alternator, but also includes uh, the cranks, the bearings, the wheel, the belt, and all the rest of it. So 
we need to think about how we separate those things out. So we either need to reduce this, reduce our mechanical power, rate, or we need to increase this efficiency uh, rating of the alternator. We need to do one or the other to compensate for, for, for the error that we've made. Now, the best way to do it, I feel, is to reduce this figure by deducting the amount of resistance which is due to the mechanical drag in the alternator. Now, alternator efficiencies um, are calculated over a number of criteria, and there's various ways of doing it. One of those is a summation of losses method, and there are roughly five categories of loss in an alternator. I'm not going to go into those. It's well beyond the scope of this video. But one of those is, is, is the mechanical inefficiency. So we need to take that out of here. So we need to trust that the experts who've measured this and given its official rating have probably done a better job than we have measuring our, um, our overall resistance with a set of kitchen scales. So we're going to keep this one and we're going to reduce this one. It means we need to take another measurement. So let's go do it. So we've got a luggage scale here. Uh, you could still use kitchen scales, but it will be a bit more awkward for this. So I've decided to use a, a luggage scale. Uh, and you see I've got a piece of cord tied onto the uh, bottom there. Uh, it's not stretchy cord, so that, that's important. And you see the other end is tied on to the alternator pulley. So what we're going to do is we're going to wind that on to the alternator pulley. And then we're going to pull up with the luggage scale. Uh, and once we've got the pulley moving, we're going to try and keep that uh, rate of ascent constant uh, based on what we said earlier so here we go given us a reading of 0.36 um, and this luggage scale is quite handy because it settles on the um, settles on the average reading so that's quite good um, now I did this a couple of times before I started filming and that is the the average that we're getting we're getting about 0.36 every time so that's looking good and um, what we need to do now is plug that back into our calculations so we have our measurement there of 0.36 36 kilograms. Now we're going to use that measurement, we're not going to make any deductions for possible angular accelerations or anything like that because we used a long cord, it's not going to be completely accurate, you know, this is um, pretty sort of low grade measuring equipment, but it's going to be there or thereabouts. We managed to maintain the speed of that alternator pulley for, for a reasonable length of time and we got the kind of average result from the scale. So uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to use that as it is. So this is a mass again and we need to convert that but we have a formula for power that works so we can plug that directly into it. What we just need to remember before we do that is that the alternator pulley will rotate at a different speed and is a different radius or diameter from the crank. So we can't multiply by the same figures that we used for the crank to get the distance. So we know that we're dealing in with a time frame of one second and we know that we're going to be pedaling at a cadence of 80, so 80 RPM. So to figure out the number of rotations per second of the alternator pulley, what we need to do is we need to, we need to get the rotations per second of the crank, which is 4 over 3, and we need to multiply that by the ratio of the gears and the ratio of the bike wheel to the alternator pulley. Now I've already measured these for another video which you may have already seen and you'll see that the gear ratio that we're using is 50 to 15 and you'll see that the ratio between the radius of the bike wheel versus the radius of the alternator pulley is 11 to 1. Now you can get these measurements, uh, this is just counting the number of teeth on the gears so that's just numbers of gear teeth that gives you your ratio. Uh, and this is just a measurement of, of the radii. So um, you just measure from the axle to the point where the belt touches the rim. Important not to measure the entire wheel because you'll have a lip on the rim and a lip on the alternator pulley. So if you measure the, the whole radius, you'll get a false reading. So measure to where the belt touches the pulleys. So to get the number of rotations per second, 
we've got 4 over 3 multiplied by 50 over 15 multiplied by 11. And that is rotations of the alternator pulley per second. So we can plug that into our formula. And then what we need is our distance. So what is the circumference of the alternator pulley? And it turns out that the radius of that alternator pulley is 2 centimetres from the centre to where the belt contacts it. So we've got 0.02 metres. Always remember to convert. Uh, if you put 2 in there, you get a false reading because we're, we're dealing with SI units, which are metres. So 0 0.2, 0 0.02 metres times 2 pi gives us our D for the alternator. So let's plug that in and let's call this power alternator mechanical. Now this of course again isn't really constant because as you turn the alternator various things are affected by rotation speed. I mean in particular the drag caused by the fan, the cooling fan of the alternator, you're going to get more drag at higher speeds. So this isn't going to be necessarily constant but within the tolerances that we are working with it's entirely acceptable and we are deducting it from our constant power. So P out mech equals M G D T to the minus one so we have 0 0.36 kilograms multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared multiplied by 0 0.02 meters which is multiplied by 2 pi because circumference is 2 pi r multiplied by our ratios so 4 over 3 for the number of rotations of the crank per second times 50 over 15 times 11 per second okay and just to check we've written that out correctly, if we multiply all these units together, we get kilogram meters squared per second cubed, which is the right, that's what we're looking for. So it turns out that this gives us 21.69 kilogram meters squared per second cubed. So we're gonna call that 22 watts because there's no point working to any more than two significant figures as we've said. So P alt mech. Now we've used P mech before, haven't we? So what we're going to say here, uh, we're going to say that P constant, because it's the portion of our power output which remains constant, roughly constant. This is what we're, that's our, our modeling assumption is that it remains constant. Equals P mech, which is the, the figure we calculated earlier minus p alt mech which is 72 watts minus 22 watts that's quite convenient isn't it makes the math nice and easy gives us 50 watts so that is our constant power well that's our working figure for our constant power so p leg is then equal to p constant plus P elect over 0.69. In other words, it's 50 watts plus P elect over 0.69. And P elect is our variable, remember, and we're going to measure that using our volt and ammeter, which is on the back. We have a, a meter there, which, which we, we, we can measure that with. So here's our formula. Let's see what that comes out to for a couple of different arbitrary electrical powers. So a laptop, an average laptop, takes about 100 watts of electrical power to power it. So what will our P leg be in order to generate 100 watts of electricity? So to generate 100 watts of usable electricity now this isn't accounting for any losses in the power pack that comes with the uh, laptop or the wiring that goes to it or anything like that or any led bulbs that we light or the, to power the meter so we're not including those things but they're going to be very minor those things so let's not worry too much about that 
Uh, this is 100 watts of usable electricity coming out of the alternator, basically. So we have P leg equals 50 watts, looks like 56, 50 watts plus 100 watts, because that's the electrical power that we want, divided by 0 0.69. That gives us 100 and 95 watts, actually 194.93 watts. Now we're working to two significant figures, so you know you can either think about that or we can just round it up because that's two that's two significant figures. So to get 100 watts of electricity, and it may be quite surprising that to some people, we're putting in about 200 watts of power at the crank, uh, which is it's quite a lot really, isn't it? To get 100 watts. Put 200 watts in. Now an alternator is not the most efficient generating device. A DC motor is actually more, a lot more efficient than an alternator, but uh, alternators are nice and easy, they're cheap to get hold of and they have voltage regulation built in most of the time, which is why we're using an alternator. But that kind of shows you, you know, what, what you can sort of get out of it. Let's think about 200 watts, uh, because what you'll find, this stays constant, remember, so we should find that it's relatively more efficient the more electrical power we generate. So for 200 watts electricity, P leg equals 50 watts plus 200 watts over 0.69. And it turns out my little pre-prepared sheet there gives us 340 watts. So here we've got, we need to put double the power in it at 100 watts to get 100 watts out. At 200 watts, we're not double, right? So it is, relatively speaking, more efficient. However, 340 watts is quite a lot of power for the average person to generate. So this gives us actually a good idea of what the upper limit uh, of stuff we can actually usefully charge with the bicycle generator is. So 200 watts, um, I can comfortably do 200 watts. I can charge my laptop, I can keep that going for several hours, that's not a problem. 340 watts though is a different ball game. Now in cycling terms we usually think of FTP, which is functional threshold power, which is the amount of power that you can sustain putting out on a bike for one hour. Now, my FTP and the FTP of most amateur average riders is definitely below 340 watts. I'm not sure exactly what my FTP is at the moment. I think it's in the high 200s uh, or thereabouts, maybe 300 watts on a good day. So I'm not going to be able to generate 200 watts of electrical power on this bike generator for an hour. I can do it for less than an hour, certainly, but I'm not going to be able to do it for an hour. And that'll be the case for most amateur average users. To give you sort of a scale of, of what you're looking at. It, riders in the Tour de France who are going up a climb, so let's say riders going up Alpe d'Huez, professional riders, the absolute best riders in the world, probably gonna be putting out something like 450 watts uh, going up Alpe d'Huez or something like that. Now, I'm not sure if that's precisely accurate, but it's gonna be there or thereabouts. So that sort of, puts into perspective what, what it's possible to do on a bike generator. And if you think about stuff you might want to power, think about a kitchen kettle, that's 3000 watts, right? So it brings home just, just how hard it is to actually generate electricity and just how much physical power is needed, you know, when you relate it to your, to your own physiology, which I find quite interesting. So this is our, these are our working figures. And these are, you know, pretty, pretty reasonable figures. Now, I am going to do the torque calculation, as I promised. Uh, but I just want to say, really, we, we've arrived here at a set of figures which are useful. They are appropriate. They're going to be there or thereabouts in terms of the, of the power that we're, that we're generating. And we can use this formula to give us a good idea of what we're going to need to generate, what we're going to need to to do with our bodies in order to generate a certain amount of electricity. And we've done that basically using a set of kitchen scales, a luggage scale, and a bit of maths. 
which I think is pretty cool. And it shows you can do some physics, you can do a bit of science, you can do stuff which is useful for your own life without a lab, without a lot of expensive equipment and without a lot of, you know, really specialist knowledge. Obviously, these figures are not mega accurate and, and the things that we've said are constant are not necessarily constant. They're going to change a little bit, you know, with various different parameters, um, conditions and that kind of thing. But these are useful figures. They, they, they're usable for the average person for the average purpose, you know, which is, which is what we're aiming to do. And we've succeeded in doing that. Now, I'm sure what you want to see is me getting a power meter, whacking it on the bike, and then pedaling away and looking at the readout to show have we actually got these figures accurate or are they completely wrong? Now, unfortunately, I've got to disappoint you because I don't have a power meter that fits that bike, I'm afraid. However, I am going to do that in a future video, so look out for that. And it may be by the time you're watching this, that video is already out. So I am going to do that. I've got to change the cranks, the non-standard cranks on that bike. So I've got to change them, unfortunately, but um, I, I will do that. However, I am a, a, an experienced cyclist. I train to power. Um, I've, I've, I've got a bit of experience of riding and generating different powers for different lengths of time. And I would say this is there or thereabouts based on you know, riding with a power meter at other times. I would say that this is this feels about right. And I have tried to generate 200 watts of electricity uh, for an hour and failed, definitely. So that is definitely above my, my FTP, my functional threshold power. Now, somebody, so it may be bugging some of you that we've called this P leg, because you may be thinking, well, actually, is that actually the power that the leg is generating? And it turns out it isn't. That's the power being put into the crank in a particular way. And at the start of this video, I promised you to do, I promised I'd do the calculation using torque. And we're going to do that. And in the process of doing that calculation using torque, we're going to see why calling the power P leg probably isn't really the right notation to use because it will, it will show us why. The torque calculation is a bit more complicated. If you uh, trust me on these figures, you can always skip that. There are chapters. I'll, there'll be chapters in the uh, in, in the thingy below, so you can click on the next one if you want to miss the torque calculation. It's a bit more complicated. It's more like A level first year degree physics rather than the kind of GCSE level physics we've been doing so far. So, just to give you an idea. Right, torque. The useful thing about doing this with torque is it does expose another problem slight problem with our original calculation method and a little bit of an issue with um, with the figure uh, which I'll come to as we get to the end. Now I'm not going to do the whole calculation with torque because as you'll see it will give us exactly the same figures as we've already got. So what I'll do is I'll do the first calculation of mechanical power that we did using those original figures uh, and then you know hopefully you'll trust me that you'll get the same if you if you did the whole thing you'd get all the same values. So the torque equation for power is power equals torque times angular velocity. And we express that usually mathematically. That's a terrible gamma. You'll have to excuse my uh, Greek letters. Gamma dot, whoops. I'm using a very sensitive pen with a, a button on it and it's quite irritating. I keep pressing the delete. Uh, gamma dot omega. Now, that dot is the scalar product, is the, is the scalar product of, of two vectors. These are two vectors. As you can see by the fact that they're underlined because I'm handwriting it. So torque is a vector and angular velocity is a vector. Now, all a vector is, is something which has a magnitude and a direction. But the scalar product of two vectors gives us a scalar or, or a number. So you still get power in watts as a, as a number. There's no direction to it. So let's break this down a little bit. Torque itself equals the vector product or cross product of two other vectors. R and F. Now F we're familiar with. F is the force um, which we measured in our early calculation to be 54.9 newtons 
and r, or the, we measured the magnitude of it, I should say, r is the position vector. So um, this has a magnitude and also a direction. So, so I'll show you what I mean. Let's draw a set of coordinate axes. Ooh, that's better than my gamma, isn't it? Uh, do excuse my writing. Now, this is the crank. So think of this as the, as the crank, and this is the axle at the bottom bracket on the bike. So the axle central spindle through the bottom bracket of the bike, and this is where the pedal is. Now, that distance there, uh, we know is the length of the crank, which is 0.175 metres. So that should be familiar from earlier. And we also have a force. And what we're going to say is that this force here is because it's applied at the pedal. Um, that's F. And that's applied perpendicular at right angles to uh, this, which is R. OK, so that is the position vector. And the magnitude, so from here to here, the distance is 0 0.175 metres. And this also has a direction because it's pointing right in that direction. It's pointing up there. So if you measured the angle there, there'd be an angle between this and the x-axis there. And that gives us the direction in which it's pointing. And you'll know trigonometry and all that you can use to calculate vectors and that kind of thing. Now, the force here has a direction. And we've, we've, we're saying that it's perpendicular um, to the... Uh, pedal axis which we're calling R. Now I'm not going to go into all the whys and wherefores of the vector product, the vector cross product, because it's beyond the scope of this video really. Um, it, it, it's, it's more complicated than we need for the purposes uh, that, that we're looking at. Now we know that we're only interested in one direction of rotation for, for instance. Um, we know that the magnitude here stays constant. So what we need really is is the magnitude of the torque. We know that the direction is going to be here. What we're going to say for our model is that the force always acts perpendicular to the uh, to the direction of the crank, okay, or our position vector. Now, in actual fact, when you're sat on a bike, the force that you apply through the pedal is not always perpendicular to the crank by no means is it always perpendicular to the crank and that is the problem that it exposes in our earlier model by using the torque method it gives us that sort of uh, illumination really in, in, into what's going on uh, but again for simplicity we are going to assume that it's that it's acting perpendicular and because that's how we measured it we know that this force is 54.9 newtons and if it's always perpendicular to get the magnitude of this torque uh, which we then don't underline it because it's no longer a vector. It equals the magnitude of the position vector times the magnitude of the force. So here we are with 0.175 meters times 54.9 newtons gives us 9.6075 newton meters. Now, we don't need all those decimal places, really, but I'm leaving them in just to demonstrate the calculation. So torque is measured in newton metres. So 9.6075 newton metres. Now, that figure won't look familiar because this is a slightly different way that we're doing the calculation. Uh, so we know that power... Power is the torque, the scalar product of the, of the torque vector with the angular velocity vector. So what's angular velocity? So let's have a look at this. So angular velocity. So let's draw our coordinate axes again. Uh, and we've got here the uh, crank with the pedal up here. And there's an angle there. Right, we're going to call that angle theta. So the angular velocity is simply the rate of change of that angle okay so angular velocity equals d theta 
by dt. So the rate of change of this uh, angle with respect to time. So this is a derivative, but again, we don't need to worry too much about that because uh, we're saying that this is constant in our modeling assumptions. Um, and what we used earlier on was a cadence of 80 RPM, right? Now, again, this will be positive. So this is a vector. So it's either positive or negative. And it's positive uh, because we're dealing here in the, uh, uh, the two dimensional plane. It's positive if it's going anti-clockwise and it's negative if it's going clockwise. Now we're only interested in the anti-clockwise rotation because that's that's how you generate power. If you pedal the other way, you're not going to be generating any power anyway because it's just free wheels. So we're only interested in that. So again, we really, we just need the magnitude of uh, the angular velocity, which is the angular speed. We don't need to worry about derivatives. Um, we are just going to say that the rate of change of this angle the crank here is going to go, if it's 80 RPM, we calculated that, if you remember, to 4 over 3, or 1.33 recurring, revolutions per second. Now, angular speed it will be is measured in radians per second. Um, so there are 2 pi radians in a full revolution. So, to, so for this if say this crank starts at the x-axis, for it to go all the way around, that's two pi radians. And it's going all the way around four over three times. So the angular speed is four over three times two pi radians per second. Now, by convention, radians is usually omitted, and it's usually uh, angular speed is usually just given as per second. So you're probably starting to see where this is going now, and some of this is, is, is going to look familiar. So um, we know our directions. We're looking for a magnitude. So what we can say, actually, is the power is going to be the magnitude of the torque multiplied by the angular speed. So power, and we're talking here, this is our first calculation um, of the mechanical power, which, where we use the 5.6 kilo uh, measurement from the scales. So this is our first measurement of PMEC. That's what we're doing. So power equals the magnitude of the torque. I'm sorry about my, my gammas are absolutely rubbish, aren't they? Um, you know what I mean. Uh, magnitude of the torque multiplied by the angular speed. So we have here nine point six zero seven five Newton meters multiplied by now four over three times two pi is eight pi over three. So I'll just simplify that eight pi over three per second. And if you multiply those together, you get 80.49 watts or 80 watts. Uh, watts being Newton meters per second, which is uh, Newton uh, meters per second is uh, kilogram meters per second squared for the Newton times meters times seconds to the minus one, which is kilogram meters squared per second cubed, which is the watt. So again, we're just checking with the SI units to make sure we've got the calculation correct. And we have. And you'll notice there, 80.49 watts and sort of simplified to 80 watts um, is exactly what we got earlier using the method that we looked at there. So this method is 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 simpler because it doesn't involve vectors and you don't need to think about scalar products and cross products and that kind of thing and what they mean. Um, so that's why we did that first. So doing this torque calculation has given us an interesting insight. And I mentioned earlier that using P leg as the notation was not necessarily the best notation to use. And what we can see here by doing it using torque is that we've modeled the force as being always perpendicular to the crank. And of course it isn't. So when you're actually pedaling, the angle that the force is applied will vary all the way through the pedal stroke. 
Now professional cyclists train and particularly time trialists train for a long time to try to get the application of force as even as possible uh, but even the pros you know can't can't do that perfectly and certainly average cyclists like me and like many other people are certainly not doing that but in any situation where we where we're trying to find a useful figure particularly for everyday figures we have to make a model and we have to make simplifications in order to make that model workable so we've been at this something like an hour if we were going to try and model the force applied by the leg and the various uh, different points of the leg and the way that they move during the the pedal action and figure out the power at different points would be at least another hour probably more so this gives us a working figure for the the power at the crank, the power applied at the crank, assuming that we've got that perpendicular application. That gives us the working useful figure that we need. Is it totally 100% accurate? Of course not. We've used kitchen scales to measure it. We used a luggage scale. We've used some approximations. We made a bit of guesswork about the angular acceleration, right? So of course it's not completely accurate. Does it represent perfectly the real world system? No, it doesn't. But does it give us a useful working figure with a reasonable margin of error? Yes, it does. And that's what we were aiming to do. So that's what we've achieved. So thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Whether you were just looking for something for fun, a bit of physics, a bit of fun physics, or you're revising for studying physics, whether it's GCSE or A-level or maybe degree physics, something like that, and you fancied a, a bit of an irreverent take, hope you've enjoyed it. Do have a look at the rest of the channel. We've got lots of stuff on there. If you've enjoyed this one, you'll probably enjoy lots of other stuff on the channel. So have a look around. And of course, if you have liked it, give us a like, give us a subscribe, all of that good stuff. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again.